Welcome to Arkansas Wildlife. It's finally deer season in the natural state, so this week we'll check in with Corey Gray, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission's Deer Program Coordinator, and get a status update on whitetail management in the natural state. Our age structure in our bucks is, is highly diverse now compared to just 10 years ago. One of the best parts of deer season is enjoying the fruits of your labor in the form of fresh venison. We're gonna take some venison over to our buddy Chris McMillan, a chef at Boulevard Bread Company, and let him work some whitetail magic. It's also a time when acorns begin falling from the oak trees like so many raindrops, providing an incredibly important food source for many species of Arkansas wildlife. This week, we'll examine the big role of the tiny acorn. All that in this week's winner of a free hunting and fishing license right after this break. Arkansas Wildlife is brought to you in part by Academy Sports and Outdoors. Right stuff, low price, every day, Academy. Quick question. How do you pronounce this word? A C O R N. It's acorn. That's an acorn. It's acorn. That's acorn in Arkansas. Yeah. I'm from Illinois. That's an acorn. How do you pronounce this word? Acorn. 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 So you have to be from St. Louis north to call it an acorn. It's an acorn in Arkansas. Southeast Arkansas. Fine blood. I had a lot of them in my front yard. No matter how you pronounce it, this little nut plays a big role in feeding many species of Arkansas wildlife. When the leaves turn each autumn, acorns fall like raindrops, feeding Arkansas critters large and small. Acorns probably explain about 95% of the variance of the squirrel population. They're highly dependent on acorns. Uh, their choices, uh, I mean, they're they're the original forester, if you will. They go along and plant them and eat them. I mean, their lives are highly correlated to the mass crop. So, a uh, very important asset for squirrels. They're also important for white-tailed deer. Would you believe acorns can make up as much as 75% of a deer's diet in late fall and early winter? They're very important, and they come at a crucial period of, our, of the year. You're, you're leaving that summer stress period. You've got females out there that's been lactating and lactation demands can, they can lose 20 to 30% of their body weights due to lactation demands. So acorns hit at that time of year, they're high in fat, they're high in carbohydrates, so they restore the body condition for the female. For the males, for their bucks, it puts them in real good standing and go into the rut. So they're building up their fat reserves for a period of time where, where their eating is really going to diminish and uh, they're going to lose a lot of their body weight. So it, it, acorns fall at that period of, in the year where it's crucial for deer, for the doe to build herself up and for the buck to get ready for breeding. Arkansas's bottomland hardwood forests provide a unique habitat where wintering ducks feast on a smorgasbord of acorns. The acorns in there provide uh, not a lot of carbohydrates, uh, a lot of lipids, uh, so really that high energy source throughout the winter months. and. Uh, really makes sense given when those habitats flood, when acorns become available, when ducks arrive in them. It's also a time of year when ducks really need a lot of high energy foods. To complete courtship and pairing, they need a lot of energy. Uh, they need enough energy to support all the extra activity it takes to engage in courtship. It takes a lot of energy, particularly for a male, to uh, put, on, put on courtship flights, participate in courtship flights, essentially to maintain that pair bond, uh, which really boils down to, to running off other intruders um, that may want to come in and also try to ch challenge that bond. So they need the energy from those acorns to get those fat reserves up, uh, to get the reserves to, to the point where they can actually uh, conduct those events. 29 species of oaks are native to Arkansas. They're divided into two main groups, red oaks and white oaks. Many wildlife species prefer the taste of white oak acorns because they contain fewer tannins and aren't as bitter. Though not as palatable, red oak acorns are also an important part of the wildlife diet. Regardless of variety, acorns have been called the cheeseburger of the forest. 
They're easy to find and nicely packaged for consumption. Acorns are high in fat and protein and packed with calories. And as many hunters know, finding acorns often means finding wildlife. Well, there's a high correlation with the number of squirrels and, and the mass crop. And, and for a squirrel hunter, man, I, you definitely want to pay attention to it when they're, when they're looking for, for a high protein, high carbohydrate diets versus, versus nuts with high fats, uh, high proteins. Uh, the amount of acorns that make it, the types of acorns that make it, when they make, I mean, you can hunt the whole forest uh, and see virtually nothing and then go to one tree that's hot, man, and, and kill a limit of squirrel. So uh, they really rely on, on acorns quite a bit. You go out to the woods, you go out duck hunting, and you just think a tree is a tree. Uh, maybe we know the difference between cypress and, and some oaks, but within the oak trees, there's huge differences in the value to ducks. And mainly it boils down to the acorn being small enough that a duck can actually get it, get it in its mouth. It's as simple as that. White-tailed deer in the Washita's and Ozarks rely heavily on acorns. Parts of our state are very mass dependent. When you look at the Ozarks and the Washita's, it's a closed canopy forest. And so when those acorns hit, that time of year is very crucial because there's very limited browse on the forest floor. If we have a poor mass crop, you may see that for, for future years. It'll impact their body weight, which may impact, especially with our females, the number of fawns produced that following spring. We don't know that relationship, the clear relationship between acorns and fawning, but it could potentially impact fawning for that following spring. Whether they fly through the treetops, jump through the limbs, or forage on the forest floor, many species of wildlife survive and thrive on the tiny acorn. But even our wildlife biologists disagree on one thing about this important wildlife food. I've been chastised for pronouncing it acorn. But it's not an acorn, it's acorn. Acorn. <laughs> I still pronounce it acorn. Unless the crowd is particularly hostile, then I will say acorn just to try to fit in. Much attention has been given to the detection of chronic wasting disease in Arkansas's white-tailed deer, but there's still a lot of good news to share about the state's deer herd. 2015 was the fourth year uh, that hunters had have legally checked over 200,000 deer statewide. Also in 2015, we actually were able to harvest more females than males, more does and bucks. It was the first time that happened in nearly eight decades of deer harvest records, and it speaks volumes about the strides we've made in deer management and the importance of managing Arkansas's entire deer herd. We're trying to focus as much attention on managing the, the female segment as we have the male segment. We will look at the age structure of our females. We want to make sure that we can uh, continue to keep a highly productive female herd to ensure that we've got fawns coming every year annually. The natural state is producing bigger and better bucks than ever. Last year, Arkansas produced a new state record typical whitetail. Jacob Acock of Tiller shot a massive five and a half year old buck that scored 195 inches. Not only the largest typical rack in Arkansas history, but the third largest typical buck in the south and the largest southern typical from outside of Texas. It's age, genetics, and nutrition. And genetics is the foundation, but then you have uh, the nutrition that plays a part in that. Um, you can have all the genetics in the world, but if you're not getting adequate nutrition, those genetics will never be displayed. So we know that antlers are genetically based, but they're environmentally influenced. Uh, you also need age. Is if you don't get the proper age, then those antlers will never be uh, observed. If you harvest that buck too early in his life, you'll never see the, the true potential. Nearly two decades under the three-point rule is paying dividends. Our age structure in our bucks is, is highly diverse now compared to just 10 years ago. We're seeing more individuals in that four and a half and five and a half age class that are being harvested. It's one thing to have them on the landscape, but it's also another thing to actually be able to harvest them. We're in this quality deer management phase right now that, that began in 1998. 
uh, with the implementation of the three-point rule statewide, but we also have two zones, or three zones, uh, zone 16, 16A, and 17 in southeast Arkansas that have the inside spread main beam length restriction. But I also think it's just the, the mindset of hunters nowadays. They want to get to that point in their, they've, they've harvested deer in their, in their life in previous years, and now many of them are to the point where they like to harvest a nice quality buck. That's putting Arkansas deer hunters way ahead of the learning curve. And with their help, the Game and Fish Commission continues to gather information to make future management decisions that will maintain a healthy and productive deer herd. We've had mandatory checking since 1938. But we also rely on our partnership with our, with our private landowners and our clubs that's participating in our deer management assistance program and the biological data that comes in. We'll collect uh, nearly 9,000 records statewide. And those data come from the, the bucks and the does, and they kind of tell us how our deer stand. And we have standards for every region of the state, every zone in the state, that a deer ought to look like this. Every two and a half year old buck should look like this, and every three and a half year old doe should look like this. And we see it as how we re ranking back to our standards. Every year we do that. We also have uh, bow hunter observation data. We have hunters throughout the state collecting observation data. We get an idea of our standing crop. And then also we have our staff and other partners in the state that collect incidental observations and that's in August and September when we're focused on our fawn production. So there's a lot of data that goes into the equation that, that spits out at the end of regulation, uh, but all of them are very important and we sit down and we take everything in and we look at it as trends. It's not just a snapshot of time, but we look at it in multiple years and then that allows us to tweak where we're at. And, and it is a tweaking process. We shouldn't take big ax swings with our regulations. It ought to be a, a fine tuning process. Arkansas Wildlife is brought to you in part by the Arkansas Game and Fish Foundation. Support wildlife and conservation education in the natural state. Become a member today. Hey guys, welcome. Chris McMillan, welcome to Boulevard Bread. This is my take on venison. First, we're going to start with the sauce. For this sauce specifically, we're going to need to start with a roux. I'm sure everybody here is familiar with a roux. If not, a roux is half fat, butter, oil, lard, etc and flour. What we'll do is we'll melt this butter. Once this butter is melted entirely, we'll start whisking in this flour, and then we're gonna cook the flour. Don't stir your roux, it's going to stick and it's going to burn. And it's gonna be bitter, nobody likes bitter. All right guys, the base of our roux is starting to come together. We have the consistency of wet sand. Now I know I have a good equal proportion of flour and butter. Now I'm gonna to continue to stir this root, and as soon as it reaches the right color and the right temperature, I'm gonna pull it off. All right guys, this is about peanut butter. This here, the reason why it's called peanut butter root is because it looks like peanut butter. Now with the chicken stock. I want to stir consistently. If I don't, you're gonna end up with lumps and no one likes a lumpy gravy. You know how thick your sauce is going to be when it comes to a boil. Once it comes to a boil, and you see how thick that is, that's how, as thick as it's ever going to get unless you reduce it. First of all, most of my cooking is very simple. I feel like if you start doing too much to it, you're gonna mess it up. So salt, pepper, and olive oil is the basis for most of my vegetables and almost all of my proteins. A nice little thin coating of olive oil you want to get all sides nice and even. You don't have to go too much, but it wants a nice sheen. It's going to promote caramelization. Caramelization is the nice crust that you'll get outside of a good steak. Salt, I do a two to one method. Two parts salt, one part pepper. Nice, even coat across the top. One more time. Now with the pepper, nice and even all the way across. All right, a good bit of olive oil in your skillet. Let your, let your skillet get hot. We want it to just barely smoke. All right, 
line, guys. When putting this loin in here, be very careful. You don't want to splash yourself with the oil. And you can't go wrong with a good pair of tongs. You'll save your fingers. Guys, it's very important not to play with it too much. Continually turn it back and forth, it'll never develop that nice brown crust that we're looking for. Oh yeah, here we go. We're gonna let this other side develop, then we're gonna finish it in the oven. And in the oven we go. Temperature I'm looking for is about 125 to 130. There's a thing called carryover. Once you get something, a piece of meat hot enough, it will carry over and cook even after it's been pulled out of the oven or pulled off the stove a good five to 10 degrees. So always remember your carryover. If you're wanting it to be 135 degrees, pull that sucker out when it's about 125 to 130. Then it will rest to the proper temperature. We got a winner. Guys, it's very important to rest the meat. If you've cut into your meat prematurely, you're likely to do what they call in the industry, juicing your board, where all the blood and all the juices run out onto your board and it leaves your meat dry. I would highly recommend about 15 to 20 minutes of rest time. Once you pull your venison out of the skillet or roasting pan, it's very important not to get rid of this. There's lots of flavor left yet in here. But what you do want to do is let the residual fat go. We don't need it. All right, for our sauce, we're going to start with a little bit of tomato paste. A little bit of honey. Then I'm going to move this around a little bit. I'm going to try to break off some of the, as they call, fond from the bottom of the skillet. If you notice, Honey got hot and it's starting to get a little bit dark. That tomato paste is starting to get a little even darker. And man, it smells glorious. Now, onto our bourbon. Fire in the hole. Let that alcohol cook off a little bit. Won't take but a second. Keep it moving. All that sugar in there, it will stick. Mmm. On with our roux base sauce. All right, we're starting to simmer. And if you notice, it doesn't take long. It's already starting to thicken up. All right, finish with a little more salt and pepper. And I believe we're there. All right, let's see how we did. Oh, it's nice and pink. All right, guys, I believe it's time to eat. What we have here is the little autumn roasted vegetables. Spread it out a wee bit. A little leftover sauce here. And we like pretty food. Garnish in here with a little microgreen. Oops. Delicious. Arkansas Wildlife presents the 2016 Watch and Win Giveaway. During each first run episode of Arkansas Wildlife, we'll give away an Arkansas resident hunting and fishing license, a $35.50 value provided by Academy Sports and Outdoors. 
At the end of the year, we'll award the 2016 Grand Prize, a lifetime hunting and fishing license provided by Electric Cooperatives of Arkansas, along with $1,000 worth of sporting goods gift cards provided by the Arkansas Game and Fish Foundation. Here's how it works. Visit the Game and Fish Commission's website at agfc.com and click on the Arkansas Wildlife icon to enter. This week's winner is Tommy Hutchison of Cabot. Congratulations and thanks for watching.